Howdy. Howdy. I want to welcome you all to Scotes Hall and the first of our centennial seminars. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity for those of you who have not had a chance to visit in this particular classroom recently, take a look around, particularly looking up. Uh, the, one of the things we've been able to do as a part of the uh, recent activities in the building is to reproduce the original appearance uh, of the ceiling, uh, redoing the chandelier and all of that. The, uh, the uh, how long ago now? February 6th, we had an event in here to celebrate kind of a grand opening. Uh, we do have a recording of that that we're going to be making available on the web, and so if you're interested in seeing that, sorry, it's already up, already up, already up. Uh, so we, we can make it, make that available if you come to the departmental homepage. You can find your way there. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone here to the Biological and Agricultural Engineering Centennial Seminar Series, as sponsored by the Cotton Foundation. Cotton Foundation was established to support the cotton industry and specifically to support related educational programs. And uh, they view our centennial activities as falling within that, uh, that uh, mission. And so uh, we're very, very pleased to have their support of this seminar series. Uh, this is the first of three lectures that will be given uh, this spring that are focusing on the uh, past accomplishments of the department. Uh, the, each of these lectures is going to be on a slightly different topic. And Alvin, are you here? There you are. Both of our next two speakers are present. Uh, the next uh, seminar will be given on March 25th by Dr. Otto Kunze and, and then April 5th by Calvin Parnell. So. Uh, I, I hope you're able to come and participate in those events as well. Today's lecture being presented by Ed Heiler. We're pleased today to have Ed Heiler to make this presentation today uh, entitled Water Engineering, A Century of Progress. Uh, and we're, we're pleased to have his wife Pat with us here as well. Uh, Dr. Heiler, who is Professor Emeritus of this department, uh, began a long service to Texas A&M when he was hired as assistant professor here in 1966. Uh, in 74, he was appointed as department head, uh, which uh, if you do a little quick subtraction, that's a, a, a pretty early age to take on the leadership role for the department. Uh, he ultimately went on to service us being Texas A&M in a variety of roles, including interim chancellor, vice chancellor for agriculture and life sciences, dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, and the director of both agencies known today as Texas A&M AgriLife Research and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Upon leaving the chancellor's office, he was the inaugural holder of the Ellison Chair in International Floriculture and retired from Texas A&M in 2007. Ed is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, he was, or is, a past president of uh, American Society of Agricultural Engineers, now ASAVE. Uh, is a fellow of ASAVE, the American Association for the Advancement of Science in the Institute of Agricultural Engineers in England. And he is a PE in the state of Texas. With that, Ed, we appreciate you being willing to do this and uh, welcome you to give this lecture. Put thing on somewhere. Okay. Put that on. Okay. Thank you very much, Steve. Great to be here. I remember the first time I stepped into this room on April 1, 1966. It looked a little different. You've done, done well here uh, in terms of what was here. And uh, it's, uh, I want to congratulate the department on this centennial series. It is uh, 
It is something that brings prestige to the department, brings prestige to the university, and, and certainly is uh, most noteworthy to do it. And, and I know it's been a lot of effort that's gone into this, and uh, your leadership is appreciated, Steve. And I want to recognize Pat over here, too. You already recognized my wife came along with me, and I want to tell you whatever I have accomplished, she's been very key in all of it. So thank you, Pat. <clears throat> so my, my topic is water, and we'll just start through this. Uh, I'll go to the next slide here. This is a, a cover of the book, the history book on the department that Henry Detloff, uh, with Steve's assistance also, so Henry and Steve are the co-authors on it, published by the a and Press, supported by AgriLife Research and AgriLife Extension in terms of the dollars to uh, make it happen. It's, it's a wonderful book. I would encourage you to get a copy of it, and it's not going to be hard to get a copy if you uh, just look out in the hall here or upstairs. Uh, after this. I'm just going to go through a few things about the department since I'm the first one doing this. Established in 1915, Elmer G. And you can see the names. The third name there is Daniel Scotes, for whom this building is named. Fred Jones, Price Hobgood, I'll have more to say about him a little bit later. Uh, myself, followed by Don Riddell, who is, who is here in the audience. Jim Gilley, Joel Bardofsky, and of course, Steve. Steve didn't start in 2015, but that's today. That's the 100 years right there. And that's a picture of Elmer G., the first head of this department when it was established. And that's Daniel Scotes, certainly a, uh, a pioneer who made a big, big impact. And it's uh, most appropriate that the building's named after him. Departmental leadership in the profession uh, is held, as best I could tell, uh, and if I'm wrong on that, somebody correct me, but uh, uh, four uh, national, international meetings, starting first in 29, 51, 80, and 2012, a couple of years ago in Dallas, in so 1981 in San Antonio. And presidents. Daniel Scotes was a president. I think he might have been a president before he was at Texas A&M. Uh, hello, Arnold. Glad you're here. And uh, Price Hopgood, myself, Terry Howell, Jr., president right now, and Mary Lee Wolf, who didn't get degrees from here, but who spent some time here as a faculty member, is uh, incoming uh, after Terry. Look at some different making contributions of the department. The first thing I would always mention when I think of difference-making contributions are the graduates. The people who graduated from here with whatever degree they graduated with, but have gone out and made a big difference uh, in the world. And if we, if we uh, sat down and, and we could do, do a long book on that, that would be very, very impressive. The graduates of this department are the number one, in my mind, uh, contribution of the department. In the early years, rural electrification was something that was very big. Uh, when rural, when uh, rural electrification was coming in, this department had a major, major role working with the electric utility companies in the state and on up uh, through recent times also. But uh, in the 30s and 40s, this was, this was a very big contribution in my, my judgment. Cotton engineering is one that uh, you will hear about when Calvin gives his talk. I would just say that H.P. Uh, Smith, name a few names, Lambert Wilkes and Calvin and, and others as well that have, uh, that have worked on this. Lambert's contribution is uh, made an impact around the world uh, in a very short time after the concept was, uh, was evaluated and put together. Rice worldwide, you'll hear from Dr. Kunze here uh, also uh, in, with the next one of these. Uh, we'll find that very interesting, I think. I've always noted that Otto had uh, greater renown on the other side of the world sometimes that he has right here for the work that he's done. Most impressive. 
water we're going to talk about today. Uh, and then I want to say local global. Obviously, the work in extension uh, and research as well locally in this state has had a big, big impact. But you look at the global effort that has uh, gone on with this department. It is, it is most, most impressive to me. Uh, work with, and I'll name a few of the countries, and I'll miss a bunch, I'm sure, but Israel was one uh, during the time that I was heavily involved in here. Belgium, uh, another major one. Uh, Africa, Afghanistan, Iraq. See Guy Phipps sitting back there. Uh, He's, he's a person who had a responsibility for a lot of that. Japan, uh, China, England, the list goes on. The global impact of our, this department. And then I would say the list goes on. So that's, so we'll talk about water here today a little bit. My personal experience coming to Texas A&M, I just want to tell you about that. Pat and I were here for an interview in the summer of 1965. It was in July of 1965, and we were coming from east of the Mississippi River in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that we found out in a hurry is, was that air conditioning was pretty important here, even, even at that time. Uh, when Mr. Homgood would take us around uh, on, during the interview to show us things, one of the things that uh, I, I thought surprising at first, but Whenever we would get out of the car, he would leave the car running with the air conditioner on it. So that when we got back in, well, anyway, that's uh, the number one reason that I came to Texas A&M, or Pat and I came, was the commitment to students that we felt here. We interviewed five different places, and nowhere did we find the kind of commitment to working with students that we found at Texas A&M, and that was something that was extremely important to me at that uh, at that time and continues to be throughout my career. The second reason, uh, and the person that had so much to do with this was Price Hobgood, who was the department head at that time. He's a person, I could go on talking about him for a long time in very positive ways. The ultimate professional, a person who was most supportive of uh, me and lots of others in the department and who, who built well, it's a lot of people built this department, but I think his contributions were extremely great, and uh, I, I think of him first. But being an engineer, uh, one of the things you do when you're trying to evaluate where you want to go is you put down all the important factors, and then you put a weight on each one of them, and you work it all out. You probably already had the answer before you did that, but you had to confirm it by numbers. I did not have the importance of water in Texas as one of the factors even in the thing. And that uh, obviously if you, if you, uh, if you're doing work in that area, it's highly visible in this state because of the importance of water. I just want to mention mentors, uh, and there's more than these, but uh, Romy Sorensen who Many of you had the pleasure of knowing. Uh, he's passed away now. Some of you uh, did not, but he was clearly. Mr. Hobgood put my office right across the hall from his, and that was uh, on purpose. I didn't know why, but I developed a close relationship, and he was a tremendous mentor for me as a young faculty member. Bob Stewart, who, who was a department head at Ohio State when I was a student there, came here as a distinguished professor a couple of years later. Uh, obviously a giant in our profession. And then uh, C.H.M. Van Babel, who passed away within the last year. He was in the Soil and Crop Sciences Department, but uh, a tremendous scientist and certainly uh, helped me uh, become a better scientist and a better researcher and a close friend and big supporter. Also, Fred Benson was the Dean of Engineering here at Texas A&M when I was a young faculty member. <clears throat> and Mr. Hobgood sent me to a, uh, to a uh, meeting. I'm not sure what, what, what the group was. It may have been department heads, but it was a fairly good sized group and Fred Benson presided. And I never will forget a statement that he made 
during that, uh, that time, during that meeting, the most important natural resource for the continuing economic development of Texas is not oil and gas. It is, you all knew the answer to that, didn't you? <laughs> it is water. And uh, he went on to explain that and, and uh, you know, I felt pretty good walking out of there being a water engineering guy, <clears throat> but I remember it well. Now, when we're talking about water uh, nationally, we have to talk about Hugh Hammond Bennett. He was instrumental in establishing the Soil Conservation Service in 1933. And it was, it was uh, timely that it would take off because that was uh, in a period uh, shortly after that, I don't know the exact years, but the Dust Bowl in, in uh, the United States, which uh, impacted practically the whole country, but certainly the, uh, the uh, middle of the country and, and west, was, was a terrible, terrible thing. Soil Conservation Service, now Natural Resource Conservation Service, but if you want to you, you see uh, the impact of, uh, of a very important uh, big man, Hugh Ammon Bennett is it. Talk about agricultural irrigation in Texas a little bit. Counts for 75% of the water use in the state of Texas. So if water is really crucial in Texas, 75% of it is used for agricultural irrigation. That's true in most irrigated, most states where irrigation is practiced. In the upper 20 counties of the Panhandle, that number is 92% rather than 75%. And 80% of the on-farm water use is from groundwater. And uh, obviously, we've all heard the story of the Ogallala Aquifer and the declining uh, groundwater tables. Now, this last statement, on-farm irrigation water has dropped 30% in the last 30 years. And in that time, we've had increased yields with, with that reduced water use. 30% drop in irrigation water, and the, uh, that leads into what we want to talk about here. Why? Why are we, are we able to use less water and get greater yields? Well, one is improved application efficiency, and we'll follow up on this. That's the thing we'll spend most of our rest of the time in this talk about, uh, irrigation application technology. Improved irrigation scheduling, ET networks, web transportation networks, obviously education and training. Uh, groundwater district, I found, have increased from 10 uh, about the time I came here to more than 70 right now, groundwater districts in the state. Uh, that's a very important. And then state water planning. And uh, that, there's a Texas water plan. There's been more than one of them in the time I've been here, but the importance of water is well recognized. Talk about irrigation technologies. Uh, flood irrigation would be maybe the first one we, we're not going to talk about all these, but uh, furrow irrigation with siphon tubes and gated pipes, high energy sprinkler irrigation, surge irrigation where you get some improved uh, distribution efficiency uh, down the rows. LEPA, low energy precision application systems, and subsurface drip as we're moving along here toward technologies that reduce the losses. 1917, this is an irrigation district up in the high plains somewhere, I believe. I see a windmill there, siphon tubes, gated pipe, and sprinkler. Now, the uh, High energies, the center pivot sprinkler system, uh, big gun, side roll, all those. Side roll was probably the first, and then the center pivot came along, the big gun was used. But, and these were used uh, uh, probably to reduce labor and some things like that. But high energy, you see, a, a, this is probably about 90 PSI out here at the end. Uh, high evaporation, throwing that water up in the air, Big guns, center pivots, side rolls. That had a uh, significant impact. There's another shot. See the road sign in the background there very well. 
This is a surge irrigation uh, controller. So let's look then at the contributions of the department in the area of water. Go back to the very beginning. It's really interesting to know that this department was put, was put together and some of the early efforts were focuses, uh, experiment station, bulletins, publications that were done related to drainage irrigation and terracing. Mr. G, Elmer G, Daniel Scotes, and, and Ayers were uh, key players there. And then um, 1958, Ernie Smerden was hired in this department. He was the first PhD engineer hired in the department. I think there were one of their PhDs, the first PhD engineer. He became director of the Water Resources Institute, Texas Water Resources Institute in 1964. And uh, in 60, Six, I guess it was, somewhere in there. He, he went to Florida and then back to Texas and then to Arizona. But I put this picture up here. He's a person who uh, passed away not too long ago. Within the last year, he had some heart uh, challenges and he died in the Cleveland Clinic. So he certainly had good care. But uh, Ernie Smerton was a big player. Myself, uh, Nolan Clark, Terry Howell, and the list could go on and on, probably about 70 graduate students, focused on irrigation scheduling on new application systems like mist and, and drip irrigation. But the whole focus of our work was stretching the irrigation water supplies, getting more yield per unit of water, <clears throat> or the same yield with a lot less water. Uh, also, in the uh, early... Uh, 70s, late 60s, uh, we had significant contributions in animal waste management that fit into the water area. Some of this is air quality as well as water quality, but Don Riddell, who is here, John Sweeten, Sukha Mukhtar, uh, Bruce Lesker, and Brent Overman are some of the players that were involved, are and have been involved there. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, LEPA and beyond, we'll talk, we'll go into more detail on that. Bill Lyle, who is here. And Bill, uh, where are you? Right there. Hold up your hand high. Uh, this man uh, has done, done great work uh, in this whole area in terms of a big contribution. Jim Bordofsky, Tom Merrick, Dana Porter, David Bordofsky, and others have all been players here. And then ARS, USDA ARS has been involved. Tom Merrick is with the, with the state, not, not the, but he has worked closely up in, up in the High Plains area with Nolan Clark and Terry Howe, both of whom uh, worked with me on their doctorate degrees. And then uh, Guy Phipps and Bruce Lesker, an extension local to global. I, uh, I have to tell you, Guy, how much I admire what you've done in your career up till now and the work that he's done in, in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and various locations in Africa. The list goes on and on. But one of the things I found when I was dean of agriculture was I would visit these outlying centers around the state and the first thing they wanted to tell me was how much Guy Phipps was helping them in their work. So, Guy. Appreciate that much. In teaching, uh, Ann Kenimer, who is uh, back here, uh, Clyde Munster, Patty Smith have all received significant recognitions. They're all water engineering people, and they have uh, contributed also in this next area of hydrologic modeling, uh, in which Vijay Singh and uh, Banayak Mohanty, right over there, is. Uh, have been doing great work, and uh, BJ is already recognized worldwide as one of the leaders in this area. But NIAC is emerging rapidly as a leader in this area, perhaps already there. I want to focus on LEPA here a little bit, low energy precision application systems, and uh, good picture of you there, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a part of this whole concept is uh, furrow diking, and uh, Bill and Jim uh, worked closely together in developing uh, a, a system to put dikes in the furrows to prevent runoff, soil erosion, and to conserve water. 
and uh, you see a diked field there, and then you see one there after a big rain. Several manufacturers began putting this, putting this equipment together, and uh, there's, it's, it's, it's made a significant impact. This is at our, our station in Halfway, part of the Lubbock Center. This is the first system that Bill and his group put together. And what you're seeing here is, uh, is applying the water, not throwing it up in the air, but putting it right down to the ground level to reduce the evaporation losses, reduce runoff losses, get, get more effective use of the water. They did a lot of work evaluating this concept picture of Bill a few years back, Bill, uh, Jim there uh, with him, measuring flow rates. This is one of the, as it says, the shop built leap applicator and one that Rainbird put together. The goal here is to provide a device, as it said, that dispensed water at low elevations that did not erode furrow dikes or the planting bed. And this, uh, we believe, at least Bill and Jim believe, I think, that, that Senninger was the first prototype of their uh, leap, leap applicator. And it's not a very good slide, but it shows you uh, that system. It brought about a lot of changes. And I think this is very important. Changes in pivot man center pivot manufacture and nozzle manufacture in pressure regulation, road directions, and the list goes on and on. This is a picture of Bill uh, with a uh, drag sock there that uh, tended to uh, uh, do even better in terms of putting the water right at the ground level and it didn't uh, take out the dikes uh, there. Now, they also evaluated using the same system for other functions. This is with chemical nozzles using the system, the system they water with, with chemical nozzles. They cycle up and down to improve coverage. They don't throw that spray out there and put it all over the country, but right where it's needed. That's a picture of those, that system where those, those nozzles go up and down. Then they also looked at using this system for planting. And here you see, uh, you see uh, planting happening uh, with the system. Get a little bit. And this is the uh, corn seed, which is put in a gel, which is applied through the system. And this shows a little bit close up of it. Uh, putting that seed in the ground with the, mul with the multifunction system. And this shows a, a cornfield that was uh, planted by this mobile irrigation planting system in a no-till cropping system. See the stubble there from the previous two years as indicated. Subsurface drip um, uh, goes even a step further. I thought I was thinking out ahead, but uh, in, in the 70s when people started talking about subsurface drip for row crops like cotton and, and sorghum and others, I thought, you know, that's, that's really a stretch. But that work is continuing to go on today with, with, the, with the LEPA system, with subsurface drip. We're getting about a 40% 40, 40 increase in, in uh, irrigation efficiency. In other words, you could use 40% less water to get the same thing or or go the other way and get more. Talk about animal waste management in a bit. Uh, 1962, there was a book published that by Rachel Carson called Silent Spring. I'm sure you've all heard of it. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a book that uh, tended to change the change the thoughts of the people of this country, I guess. Uh, in terms of what we might be doing uh, to the environment and to our, our long-term viability on this planet. 
in the, in the front of that book, she dedicates the book to Albert Schweitzer. He says, and that's, that's what's in the, in the dedication, man has lost the capacity to foresee and to forestall. He will end up by destroying the earth. That was some motivation for her. And in the 70s, uh, in the 70s, the Environmental Protection a Agency was established, the Federal Clean Water Act, Texas Policy and Regulations, what is now the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, uh, was, was uh, established, and there was a lot of effort putting for, put forth toward uh, the environment. In the 70s and 80s, uh, John, you came in what, 69 was it? 70? R right in that area. John Sweeten came a, a year or two uh, later. Um, and that, a major program evolved in this department uh, looking at animal waste management. Focus on beef cattle feedlots, dairies, poultry operations. Various things were done as indicated there. Don't have any pictures to show this, but high rate land application of manure and wastewater, deep plowing, prevention of direct discharge, through manure management practices, non point source water quality management, and lots of partnerships that uh, made a big difference. Regional water planning. In the 90s and 2000s, major hires here uh, that focus on this area. Guy Phipps, Bruce Lessiker, Brent Auberman up at the Amarillo Center, Saqib Mukhtar uh, on his way to Florida. Now, a note. And there's been several awards received from this, this group. USDA Superior Service Award, EPA Environmental Excellence Award, two TECQ Environmental Excellence Awards. And, and these awards are in both water quality and air quality. And some of the work of some of these people has focused on air as well as water. So let's uh, kind of wind up by looking at the future of water in this state. Texas Water Plan uh, has a lot of information in it, but focus by saying that by 2060 we will have 80% more Texans um, than we have today. And we, therefore, we'll have 57 million people needing water in Texas. Remember agriculture, 75% of use of the water use in the state. Uh, more and more people. This is one urban areas obviously will get uh, first attention, most likely. So we have a state water plan, Texas water plan. It's a fairly recent one. There have been earlier ones uh, that is, uh, has been approved. And in that water plan, we ask, how will those needs be met when we get to 2060? And the, this is the way it, they, they break it out. One third by conservation and reuse. Obviously, that's the easiest one, but the one that's not, not done nearly as well as it can be done. Go over some places in the Middle East and Israel, you see what is possible in some of those areas where they have a whole lot less water than we do. Uh, one third from new water sources and infrastructure, that would be infrastructure could be dams uh, also. And also included in that is incentivizing desalination, which uh, obviously has uh, has great possibilities, the cost still being uh, prohibitive. And then one third, the other one third from, from uh, financing local water projects. So, in conclusion, statement by Ben Franklin, when the well is dry, we'll know the worth of water. So true. This department has made major contributions to date. From, its, from the inception in 1915 to today. Big challenges, big opportunities in meeting the future needs as we go forward. And I'm confident that with the, the talent and the commitment that is here, 
in this department that uh, the future will will be very bright in, in this area. So I appreciate very much the opportunity to be here. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I don't know, where are we, Steve, on time? Yeah. Time for a question or two? Well, it, it is, you know, when I came here, uh, there was no such thing as tenure at Texas a and It came in about three years later, and Mr. Hobgood said, fill out this, and so I got tenure. And so it's a lot different today than what it was then. However, here's what I feel about it. If, you, if we keep students as the number one priority, keep that number one, and then do the rest of the things that we love to do also, Everything works, but, but you've got to keep students as number one or it all starts to, you might as well be in a research institute somewhere away from a university if you don't have students as number one. So that's a passion of mine as you can tell. Other questions? Well, thank you very much again. Thank you, Steve. Oh, you need the mic, don't you? Thank you again, Ed, for that presentation. And uh, thanks to each of you in the audience for coming to participate today. We do have a reception scheduled upstairs uh, in room 305. For those of you who have not been in the building for a while, 305 is not where it used to be. Uh, you have to walk down the hall a little bit toward the north wing to find the door into 305. Uh, uh, another of the reconfigurations that occurred as a part of the capital improvement project. So I invite you all uh, upstairs. Uh, you, perhaps as you came in, you saw the tables outside where the A&M Press has some copies of the books available. Henry has agreed to come and uh, sign books. If, if for those who would like to, uh, to receive one. Uh, and so I'd, I'd uh, urge you to pick up one of those. They, uh, Shannon, they are going to ultimately be available, well, they will be available to purchase from the press. There will be electronic versions that can be purchased from Amazon, correct? As well as hard copy versions there. But if you buy them here, there's a discount, right? That's right, yes, correct. Um, the, the, uh, Ed noted on one of the slides here that uh, our centennial book is a part of the AgriLife series, a, a whole series of books that have been sponsored and authored by people associated with uh, Texas A&M AgriLife agencies. Uh, one of those uh, book published, what, two, three years ago or so? All right, with that, uh, thank you, and uh, yes, Russell? Oh, yes, another of the improvements. Uh, we do have an elevator. Uh, if you uh, wish, you feel free to ride the elevator. Uh, if, if, you, uh, if it's easier going down steps than up, we can go out the door here. There's a ramp that we can go in the side and catch it on the first floor as well. So that, I look forward to uh, interacting with all of you upstairs. Thank you for coming.